Hey guys, welcome back to Tank Reviews with me, Invictus Sigismund. Uh, first video of the new year. Uh, I apologise about the late output. It's just been a difficult start to the year with work and that, but you know we're starting to pick up a bit. I've been able to write a ton of scripts, so hopefully we'll be able to get this going properly. Um, so we're moving to something a little bit different today. Normally I do World War Two era vehicles. We're pushing instead out into a vehicle that I actually really, really like, um, which is obviously the Challenger 1 main battle tank. Um, so the Challenger 1 is known primarily as one of the better tanks Britain produces during the Cold War. The Challenger 1 uh, was the primary arm of the British Armoured Forces for just shy of 20 years. But during this period, it would establish itself as one of, if not the best MBTs in the modern world, casting off the shadow of its predecessor, the Chieftain, and paving the way forward for modern British Armoured Forces. So obviously the origins of the tank are a bit strange. They are It's rather bizarre actually how this tank ends up becoming the primary arm of the British Forces. So originally the tank was never meant to see service within the British Army. It initially was a very heavily developed version of the Chieftain, it was heavily modified, for service with the Iranian government, who the British were close allies with. At the time uh, of its development, Iran was going through a conflict with Iraq, the Iran-Iraq war, which would last for nearly a decade. The Iranian government had ordered a request for a new version of the chieftain, as the current chieftain they had basically was not very good. Uh, the T-72, which the, Iraqi, which the Iraqi army was using, was capable of knocking out a chieftain, you know, without any issue. The chieftain could effectively return fire, but, you know, the T-72 had a better chance of standing up to the chieftain compared to the chieftain standing up to the T-72. This wasn't helped by the fact that a lot of the ammunition sent for the chieftains in, Ir in the Iranian service were very, very poor. Regardless of which, they asked for a new vehicle in the 70s as a result of the ongoing war with Iraq. Three designs would be put forward by the Military Vehicles and Engineering Establishment, or MVEE for short. Before it could be decided upon, however, the Iranian Revolution decided to take a massive swing and pipe in that idea. It, the Iranian Revolution of February 1979 suddenly happens, and all of a sudden, one, Iran becomes a hostile power, and second, the order which has had a lot of money put into it suddenly has no buyer. It is at this point that the British Army decides it's going to step in and basically rescue the entire situation. The British Army's been looking to replace the Chieftain in service. The Chieftain itself, I'll do a video on, basically, long short of the Chieftain is, the engine is a multi-fuel engine and it can run on four types of fuel, just not very well. <laughs> you can run it on a lot of things, but it just doesn't run very well. It was part of NATO's big plan to basically make all vehicles in NATO service run on multiple forms of fuel so they could fire anywhere in Europe. Problem was, we were the only ones who did it, and we didn't do it very, very well. <laughs> so, we're looking to replace the Chieftain in service, and at this point, the British Army contact MVEE and basically ask if the Challenger is still around. They say yes, and they basically send a bunch of requests to change it to fit more along Western doctrine, we'll call it. These things have basically been built for desert service, which means that there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. You have to obviously take into consideration the filters, the, you know, obviously things like carburetors and things like that. Basically, will sand get stuck in it and will sand cause it to break down? That isn't an issue when you're fighting in Western Europe where there is no such thing as sand, it's just, you know, you might get dried dust particles, but that's not really so much of an issue. So originally the design is to be called the Chevrot, but would be renamed the Challenger, f f which it takes the namesake from the World War II cruiser tank, which I've already done a, a, uh, a vehicle review on. So one of the most significant advantages of the Challenger when when it is developed, is the British Army want to install a form of armour known as the Chompham armour. The Chompham armour is 
one of the most coveted secrets in the tanking world. No one truly knows what the Chopham system is actually made of, and to our knowledge, only three vehicles use it. The Challenger 1, the Challenger 2, and the M1A2 Abrams. The reason why this armour is so secretive is because of its extreme hardness. Regular armour plating, such as steel plating, it deter it's determined mostly by how thick the armour is. With the Chopham armour, you don't have this. Because the Chopham armour is basically, it makes it harder. It's, it's designed to just be so much harder than steel. And so it doesn't matter necessarily how thick it is, as long as it's hard enough, it will basically do the exact same job as maybe steel, which is two or three times as tough. Or two or three times, sorry, as thick. So this armor basically worked by causing shape charged ammunition to just fail on impact, and it caused kinetic projectiles to either ricochet off or just straight up shatter. For, those, for anyone who has ever studied Soviet ammunition, you'll know full well that Soviet ammunition is not very is not made very well at the best of times. Um, the Germans during the Second World War had encountered Soviet-made ammunition that would just shatter on contact with their own armour when the gun should have quite easily penetrated. But because of the quality of the shell, it just shattered on contact. And Chopham armour was basically designed to take that to the absolute max. By the time of its installation on the Challenger 1 in 1983, it makes the Challenger 1 the toughest tank on the planet bar none. Yes, I know there might be the odd American that comes in and says, oh, the Abrams is just as good as the Challenger. Look, the Abrams with the Chompham armor, absolutely, it is probably just as good. However, in 1983, when the Abrams doesn't have this, it is nowhere near the best tank in the world. The Challenger 1 is the best tank bar none. It's better than the T-72, it's better than any T-80. It's better than it's better than the leopards. <laughs> you know, we know this. Another thing that would make it one of the best tanks, if not the best in the world, is the 120mm L11A5 rifled gun. This is the same gun which is used on the Chieftain, but this time they basically do some modifications to it to make it slightly more potent. This gun will remain in service ultimately until 2001 when they put the L30 on the um, on the Challenger 2. The L5 main gun used on the Challenger 1 is fantastic for long range shooting because unlike pretty much every other western nation, Britain uses rifled weapons on their tanks. The Leopards, the Leclercs, the um, Abrams tanks, and everything in Soviet inventory, they're all smoothbore. They're all smoothbore because they like to fire heat ammunition. The British Army likes its rifled weapons. We are obsessed by rifling. Now, yes, I know the Challenger 3 is going to a smoothbore design, and yes, I am slightly infuriated by that fact, but regardless, at this point, we're using rifled weapons. The gun itself has a length of 22 feet and 6 inches and a barrel length of about 55 caliber. The shell in question is a bag charge type and the gun can put out about 6 to 8 rounds a minute, which is not too bad given you know, given the fact that this is a manual loading system. When introduced, the cannon was originally fitted in line with a 50 caliber machine gun mounted just above it because the two have roughly the same velocity given given the respective calibers. This meant that the 50 cal was meant to be used as a rangefinder, effectively, before <laughs> before the British actually installed a rangefinder. So the 50 cal was meant to be a rangefinder initially. This works completely fine, but they sort of realise this is a bit meh cr cruddy. It is replaced in 1971 by the Bar and Shroud LF2 Tank Laser Sights, or TLS for short. It's basically a laser rangefinder, which is added in about 1975 as well. Sorry. Basically, they add the tank laser sight in 1971, and then they add a laser rangefinder in 1975. This basically pumps up the tank's accuracy. You know, <laughs> you know, it's it's ridiculous. 
This basically allows it to engage targets out to nearly five kilometers or 5,000 meters. This is extraordinary. And unlike smoothbore weapons, the rifling can hit that far because the rifling keeps the round on target far better than a smoothbore weapon will. Now this is not saying that smoothbore weapons are inaccurate. They're not, okay? You know, the the tanks which use smoothbore weapons are still accurate and deadly, but the point is, is there's a reason why the Challenger 1, as you will find out, still holds the longest record for a tank-to-tank -tank engagement, and that's because the rif rifling is just that much better for accuracy. There was also a, th a further improvement in gunnery with the adoption of the Marconi Improved Fire Control System that was fitted to the Chieftain in 1979 and there was ultimately be used on the Challenger as well. This would ultimately be the system which would make the tank so lethally effective in its combat time in the British Army, as obviously we'll talk about shortly. So by 1980, with the tank having changed quite considerably since the original Iranian design, production was begun in Leeds by the Royal Ordnance Factory of Leeds. The Challenger 1 would enter service with the British Army in 1983 and production would only cease in 1990 with a total of 420 of these vehicles being built for a cost of around £2 million uh, per vehicle. The actual cost of the vehicle was £1.5 million but when you add all the various other parts you're looking at more along the lines of £2 million. In 1986 the Royal Ordnance Factory of Leeds was acquired by Vickers Defence Systems who would continue the run up until the end date of around 1990. At this point, the Jordanian government sort of comes in. The Jordanian government initially purchased 274 challengers under an agreement that was signed in March of 1999, with another 288 surplus challenger ones being supplied to Jordan over a three-year period. Uh, this would enable Jordan to replace its Centurion fleet, which it had. This has all become relevant when we talk about who still uses the Challenger 1 in service. So 221 Challenger tanks would be deployed to Saudi Arabia for Operation Granbury, which was the UK's participation in the 1991 Gulf War. As part of the original deployment of the 7th Armoured Brigade, two armoured regiments, the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars and the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, which were both equipped with 57 Challenger 1s, this being the Mark III version, they were, modifi they were heavily modified for desert service by... Um, by multiple teams of civilian contractors and REME engineers in Saudi Arabia. These upgrades included fitting additional Tromham armour to the sides of the vehicle, add explosive reactive armour or ERA along the nose and the frontal glacis plate. Basically they'd read the combat reports coming from the Iranians which basically said be aware the Iraqis love RPGs, <laughs> Yo, be prepared. <laughs> So, alongside this, they would add ex uh, extra external fuel tanks and a smoke generator. Uh, unlike a lot of modern tanks, the Chieftain couldn't produce its own... S oh, not the Chieftain, sorry, the Challenger. Uh, the Challenger couldn't produce its own smoke. Okay, they don't use the engine type. You know, the Americans use... Uh, I can't remember what the engine type was actually called. They use this ridiculously powerful high-power high, high power engine... The British are just stopped using a diesel engine because we're just like, yep, yeah, we're chill. <laughs> we don't like that. During the 1991 Gulf War, there are major concerns regarding the reliability of the Challenger 1 in the build-up. A lot of this stems from the British Army's experience with the Chieftain main battle tank and that multi-fuel engine which I talked about. This, basically they're worried that, that the, the Chieftain will plague the Challenger 1 because the Challenger 1 is basically just a, a just a heavily modified Chieftain. So they're worried about the tank design and the climates in particular, because bearing in mind what they were originally designed as, the British Army had done a complete 180, <laughs> and so a tank that was designed in the desert was then redesigned to work in Western Europe, but he's now fighting in the desert. <laughs> so there is this issue. So why the massive concerns about the temperature and the faults of it I mean, oh. before the commencing of, of the Gulf War, only 22 Challenger 1s were operational because of faults and lack of spare parts. Because of this, this is mainly because the vehicle's only been serviced for about seven years, and there aren't enough major parts available 
for rapid use. Uh, they, you know, they haven't built them on mass. They don't have enough. It's just like, oh god, it's it, it's all it's all awful. In November of 1990, um, while the build-up for the operation is still going on, it's decided to add the Fourth Armoured Brigade to the force, and these are all put under the umbrella of the UK Armoured Division, uh, who also have another <laughs> couple of brigades added to it. The 14th 20th King's Hussars, equipped with 43 Challengers, and then reinforced by a squadron of the lifeguards. These were both equipped with Mark II versions of the tank, which again was upgraded with armouring the storage bins for the 100mm charges. They also had additional trombine armour, same as the Mark III's. At the outbreak of the war, the conflict um, will effectively see multiple variations of the Challenger 1 fighting in the country. They're all combat effective, they're all decent vehicles, there's just like very little changes. They all have trombine armour though, that's the, that's the key point. They all have a trombine armour, which is like I said, the, the, the toughest stuff in the world. You know, you can imagine being some poor Iraqi who's sitting there in a T-55 and thinking to yourself, that's a big scary tank coming towards me and I can't kill him because he is the toughest thing in the world. So, during Operation Desert Shield, uh, which is obviously the build-up to Operation Desert Storm, which is when they're bombing... Uh, Iraq, and they're obviously going after the divisions in Kuwait, it is decided that the 1st UK Armoured Division, which is all the armoured forces of Britain, is all put into one divisional command, they operate under the US 7th Corps. This corps is basically the armoured fist of the entire invasion. It comprises all the heavy armour that makes up the offensive. Um, the Marines aren't a part, the US Marines aren't a part of it. The US Marines will go into Kuwait with their armour, but they're using things like M60s, which are not terrible, but not really what you want. And so 7th Corps, which comprises all the armoured forces, if you imagine that you're, that you're fighting from Saudi Arabia into Iraq, and you look from across your front line, you know, on your far left you have the likes of the Marines and the French Foreign Legion, and they're rapid, these are the rapid guys, and airborne units especially, they will they will literally do this great big sweep to the north of Iraq, and they'll do that in about a week. In the middle, you have all the US forces. You have the likes of the 3rd Cavalry. You've got 1st Armoured Division. I think even the 3rd Armoured Division is there. They'll provide the main bulk. And then on your right, you have this single UK Armoured Division, which is which has the most powerful tank in the world. And basically, the whole objective of the UK 1st Armoured Division is to smash a hole through the Iraqi defensive line. Everyone else will miss it. Everyone else is going to miss it. The British are basically just going to throw themselves at this defensive line. So the 7th Corps is under the command of Frederick M. Franks Jr. Under his command, the, the 1st Armoured Division, the 3rd Armoured Division, 1st Infantry Division, the Mechanised, and the 1st UK Armoured Division, the 1st Cavalry Division, have had a whole number of additional unit assets. In total, 7th Corps has 1,487 tanks, and 221 of these are the legendary Challenger. That is a number which would have been seen during the Second World War. This is a ridiculously big task force which we're talking about here. So during the crossing into the, of the Saudi border into Iraq, the challenges of the 1st uh, Armoured Division compromising the 7th Corps, they're on the most eastern part, okay? They're basically, they're on the right of this entire offensive. The challenges will form the spearhead of the advance with the division advancing nearly 350 kilometres in just 97 hours, with a lot of the mechanical worries really not being too much of an issue. During this time, and during the fighting over those 97 hours, they destroyed the Iraqi 46th Mechanized Brigade and the 52nd Armored Brigade and elements of at least three infantry divisions belonging to the Iraqi 7th Corps. In a series of battles and engagements, they would ultimately capture and destroy around 300 Iraqi tanks and a very large number of armored personnel carriers, trucks, reconnaissance vehicles, and many more. Basically, the British 1st Armored Division wipes out half the defensive line in 97 hours. Whatever anyone thinks of the 1991 Gulf War, many people will think, oh, you've got the Battle of um, 
you you got about the seventy three each things. The the American armored force they they wipe out the Republican Guard with their T seventy twos. Yeah, that's very very impressive, and I and I think that that is one of the most impressive actions of the war. But don't forget the British armored division wandered straight into the Iraqi the Iraqi defensive line, blew it up, destroyed five divisions in the process, and then just proceeded to outflank the defensive line. They just went round it. <laughs> you know. I thought, hey Germany, I could do it better than you. Goes round giant defensive line. So the main threat to the Challenger is deemed to be the Iraqi Republican Guard T-72M tanks. These prove their worth against the the chieftain in the Iran Iraq War, and really the Challenger is sort of there to like say, yeah, we're we're here for a little bit of vengeance. In response to potentially facing the Republican Guard, however. The Challengers are equipped with 12 L26A1 depleted uranium rounds, specifically for tackling T-72s. This is... The use of depleted uranium rounds is a bit of a controversial one. I am not going to go into the controversy surrounding it, um, because ultimately this isn't this isn't a channel on politics, it isn't a channel about the controversy around stuff. All you need to know is they use depleted uranium ammunition. During the operation, however, they don't encounter any T-72s, so the depleted uranium rounds aren't really required. The Republican Guard has retreated all north. Uh, they will ultimately be largely wiped out, especially the Talakama Division will get wiped out of the hands of US forces, who are also equipped with depleted uranium ammunition. <laughs> you know, uh, but they have theirs for smoothbore guns. So one of the biggest positives for the British force at this time is the use of the Global Positioning System, also known as the GPS. This, combined with thermal observation and gunnery systems that were fitted to the Challengers, proved to be decisive in any combat they'd ultimately face. Bearing in mind they're not facing the Republican Guard, they're facing standard Iraqi divisions. So they're fighting T-55, T-62s, maybe they'll get lucky and fight Type 59s. They're not... They're facing tanks which are just completely obsolete in the face of the Challenger. So, it's it. Like I say, Britain is believed to have destroyed roughly 300 tanks during this engagement. Due to their position on the far right of the entire coalition advance into the Iraqi desert, they were able to effectively tackle the main defensive line. Basically, and basically, they just covered the, the the American swing round to basically try and cut off the Iraqi army in Kuwait. It's anchored entirely on what the British do on that right, and the British on the right flank just destroy five divisions and pretty much just go, yeah, all right, then job done. <laughs> job done. You know. The manoeuvre ultimately dooms the fate of the Iraqi army in Kuwait because they're forced to hurriedly withdraw along the highway of death. And, you know, the Americans use this great big shock and awe assault across the desert, and they wipe out anything they encounter but it all hinges on what happens on that right flank, and that right flank is entirely is entirely down to the challengers and the warriors of the British armoured divisions, who just could proceed to absolutely wipe them out. So, besides the obviously... Okay, so the most decisive engagement that everyone knows about is the challenger on the 26th of February 1991. During this engagement, a tank of the 11th Battalion of the Royal Scotch Dragoon Guards would fire an armour-piercing, fin-stabilised disc discarding shot at a range of 5,100 metres. This round would destroy an Iraqi tank. I believe it is a Type 59 that actually hits. This is the longest tank shot in history. Nobody comes close. Nobody comes close. Bearing in mind that that is beyond the range the gun was theoretically designed to hit. It is a ridiculously long shot. Now everyone can argue, oh, I was only against a Type 59. Don't care, still counts. <laughs> Rifled guns are good. Fight me. <laughs> you know? Apart from the 1991 Gulf War, Challengers would also play a very small part in Operation Joint Guardian, which was part of the NATO-led drive into Kosovo during the wars between Bosnia and Herzegovina and that the whole mess that is the old Yugoslav Wars. There is no considerable tank or tank action to take note of. There's, there's very little to take note of in this regard. So in 1985, the UK Ministry of Defence orders a derivative armoured vehicle recovery vehicle, sorry, from the Vickers Defence to replace those that have been based on the uh, FE420 
for Chieftain chassis. The Challenger Armoured Repair and Recovery Vehicle, or C-R-A-R-R-V, is an armoured recovery vehicle which is based obviously on the Challenger 1 hull. It is designed to repair and recover damaged tanks on the battlefield whilst also being under fire. 80 vehicles were delivered to the British Army between 1899 and 1993. Four vehicles were ordered and delivered to, the, to Oman in conjunction with their purchase of Challenger 2 tanks. The armoured repair and recovery vehicle has five seats but usually carries a crew of just three. These come from the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers and are trained primarily in the recovery of mechanical failures and to do with obviously repairing other vehicles. The extra two spaces are primarily for extra crew should the vehicle they're going to need new guys to replace wounded soldiers. The Challenger armoured repair and recovery vehicle loses the main armament but instead can have a variety of things fitted in case you just need to tackle any problem. They can have a main winch, which uh, which has which can pull about 50 tons of force, and there's also a 98-ton force version, <laughs> uh, which actually a pulley version, sorry, which um, uses the tank basically as an anchor point, and it can lift just about it can lift up to 98 tons. The vehicle could be deployed with an Atlas crane, which can lift uh, 65,000 kilograms or 40,300 uh, 40, pounds at a distance of 4.9 meters or 16 feet. This is enough to lift the Challenger 2 power pack, which makes it ideal for making quick switches to engines in the field, but without the Challengers being forced to withdraw to you know, really far behind the lines. The tank can also be set to use a dozer blade and used as an earth anchor or stabilizer or an obstacle clearance uh, or fire, posi fire position preparation. The clearance part is really ideal um, for things like urban environments where militias have a tendency to just block the roads with other vehicles. This vehicle has remained in service with the British Army. It's still in service. Um, they just upgraded the powertrain to the Challenger 2 with a newer engine and better transmission. Um, despite this, the originals have been in service with the British Army. They were in service uh, during the Gulf War in Operation Granbury in 1991 and have seen service in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. You know, I, I believe they're still in service. In terms of current operators around the world, the Challenger 1 is only used by Jordan. The Jordanian government has 392 Challenger 1s currently on the books. However, these are all scheduled to be replaced by 441 Italian Army B1 Centaro 8x8 mobile gun systems, as well as ex-German model 1A3 infantry fighting vehicles. There was an attempt to get the Greek Army to adopt the Challenger in service as they wanted to replace their obsolete vehicles. The Challenger was sent to compete against the Leopard 2A6, the M1A1 Abrams, the Leclerc, the, T the Ukrainian T84 Oplot, and the Russian T80. The Challenger would ultimately lose the competition with the Greek government choosing to adopt the Leopard, which it still has. As for the Challenger Armoured Repair and Recovery Vehicle, 80 still remain in service with the British Army and has simply been upgraded, and the Kingdom of Oman has four in service. So yeah, that is the Challenger 1 main battle tank. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please like and subscribe, comment down what you want to see, and yeah, have a good one.